The dollar continues to be eroded out from underneath us. And in a government that in the last four years has printed more money than in the history of the United States prior to it, yeah, it's a big deal. It, it's a trend that's not showing any sign of abating. In fact, at a trillion dollars of debt every hundred days, a trillion seconds ago, Kai, was 31,688 years ago. We are addicted to spending. The future of the dollar is in trouble, and that's why we own gold. The new BRICS settlement currency called the unit, which will be 40% gold-backed, which will be deliverable if requested, uh, and be traded on Project Embridge. And so when you talk about the need for gold, it's extraordinary. Special coverage from the Rules Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida, is brought to you by Contango Ore, developing Alaska's next gold mines. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host of this channel. Really looking forward to this conversation because we're at the Boca Raton Resort at the Rule Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. What a beautiful place. And I'm joined by the beautiful Andy Schechtman. Andy, it's good Thank to see you Thank you, brother. Again. You're too kind. It's always good to see you, Kai. And I mean that, too. <laughs> no, I appreciate that, Andy. And uh, really appreciate we, we chatted only a few weeks ago, like two, three yeah. weeks ago. And uh, I promised uh, we'll ask our audience some questions. So we're going to start there. Got a couple other topics lined up, but I want to start with the audience questions because the audience is important to us right and uh, you know for, first uh, first question has been a follower and subscriber for a long time thanks for your informative insights and interviews uh, please give us um, as somebody who's taken a leap of faith emptied out our 401s we can talk about how much sense that makes at the age of 59 um, how you put half of that in the, in the US and open a self-directed IRA right um, his question maybe summarize it exit strategy because you bought a lot of silver um, you bought uh, maples and eagles and uh, what should be his exit strategy well to me um, one of the, the the biggest benefits of the precious metals IRA Kai is the ability to physically distribute those metals in kind which is a taxable event but first and foremost I think any exit strategy would need to be weighed against the ability to possess the metals at some point down the road if you're doing it before you're 59 and a half, not only would you have regular income tax, but also a 10% penalty. But as the, the listener said, they're over 59 and a half. So the only then consideration would be the income tax. The ability to possess it to me, though, is really the whole reason to think of a precious metals IRA, because it is physically held in a depository. Just going to ask you real quick, what does IRA stand for? Uh, individual retirement account. Okay. So the ability to to allow that to grow for you in terms of gold and silver's appreciation, have it held, segregated in a vault, and then the ability to possess it if indeed you want. But look, I, you know, I think the 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 traditional answer would be that everything has cycles and that there will come a time, perhaps, when precious metals run their cycle and you look for something that possesses um, an undervaluation, if you will, to, to uh, what one would think those asset prices should be. Um, I think we're still a long ways away from seeing gold and silver fully accentuate themselves. But when you look at all the traditional assets, stocks and bonds and real estate over the last several years, largely thanks to trillions of dollars of freshly created money and for the most part, very low interest rates, which created distortions in asset prices, misallocations in capital and resources. And those prices got so high that we haven't seen the undervaluation side of those asset classes yet either. So to me, the exit strategy could be one of two things. One, to take physical possession of the metal and to bring it home, which is a taxable event. Who knows what the future brings? And the other would be to sell those assets, the metals, when the price got really, really high and look for something undervalued, something maybe you've had your eye on for a long time, whether it be, you know, blue chip stocks or or even pulling it out and buying that coastal real estate or that lakefront real estate you've wanted forever that thanks to low interest rates and easy money has been distorted. Maybe it turns out to be the value of a, of a lifetime. Who knows? No. Okay, no fantastic. Like by, by the way, this is not personal investment advice or anything. This is just for information purposes. So not def, not financial advice or anything like that. A really important dimension. Um, interesting question. Like, what do you think the future of your business is going to be? Um, there's a lot of fiat, way less precious metals out there, and prices are going up much higher. So they're becoming somewhat unaffordable to a degree, like at least on paper. If you Interesting look at question. It. No one's ever asked me that. Kai, they say there's no bull market like a gold and silver bull market because it appeals to people's concern, their fear. They say we're motivated in two ways, and I guess it's an overgeneralization, but that by fear and greed. Most every investment would appeal to our greed. We want to make money. 
Uh, fear is different. And the higher the price goes, or the scarier the world gets, or both only reinforces the motivation that would have been employed to buy the metal to begin with, thereby tightening the grip, not wanting to sell it. So in that event where metals really take off, look, Rick Rule, who puts on this conference, will tell you that the allocation from Joe and Jane six pack to the Harvard Endowment Fund is less than one half of 1% in terms of metals allocation across the whole United States matrix of financial assets. The average, he'll say the mean, would be roughly two and a half percent over the last 40 years, which would be a five-fold increase if we just got to a two and a half percent allocation. So what happens is at some point in my mind's eye, I see an awakening by the mainstream, whether it be market-driven, um, well, probably will be market-driven, I guess I would say, and that awakening uh, will make it very difficult for people to source product. And in that environment, no one's going to sell back their metal unless they are forced to for whatever reason, but because they don't want to go back into the system and back into fiat. So when you ask, what will the future be? I have been consistent for years, going all the way back to when Rick put this conference on in Vancouver. And I would say this market ultimately will be defined by much higher prices. And those would be the people looking from the outside. But the people like you from the inside would say, geez, you know, it's really hard to get that stuff right now, isn't it? It's impossible to source it timely and affordably. So I think it's a very valid question whereby price and availability and a, a collective realization of how important it is late in the game could make owning a business like mine very challenging just simply because the transactions will be hard to come by. No one wants to sell. And those that want to buy, well, certainly won't be as easy as it is now. Would it be of interest to turn it into a storage business? Over well, we a have a very vibrant deal? storage yeah. business, and that's a good question too. Yeah. And and that is a business that that has some sort of of uh, residual income to it. We have worldwide exclusives with Brinks. Uh, we have nine vaults around North America that we're very proud of, uh, of of our relationship with Brinks. But you know, that only goes so far. And um, certainly, having one without the other having a, a, a brokerage business without a storage business, well, that would certainly diminish your options. Mm -hmm. Having a storage business without a vibrant uh, brokerage business also diminishes your options and, and your potential uh, to run a vibrant business. So yeah, I think about these things and it's the only, first time any, anyone's ever asked me the question and it's a good one. And it's one that I probably will be thinking <laughs> about for the next uh, several nights as I lay in bed and stare at the uh, ceiling. Thanks a lot, Kai. I appreciate oh, you're, you're that, welcome man. there. No, I, no, no, I didn't ask the question. It was somebody uh, on, on no, YouTube. No, I'm so. teasing. I'm totally no, joking. I appreciate the question, though. Um, next, next couple of questions are more macro questions, and we can sort of lead sure. into the macro discussion here as well. Um, one, one question for Andy is here. People talk a lot about the gold silver revaluation to numbers like $40,000 and $200. Um, that's for gold and silver. Um, but what would be the purchasing power? at that point of, of those ounces. Um, the US dollar is quickly decreasing in value. People say, oh, gold was $100 an ounce back in 19 whenever. Um, but you could do a lot more with your currency decades ago, or a decade ago, or decades ago. Right. right. Well, and that's one thing that we find throughout all of time is that gold and silver don't go up in, in, in dollar value. It, it's Well, they do, but it's not that gold and silver are going higher. It's the dollar is, is losing purchasing power. So if we go back to 1971, when we left the, the uh, when we delinked gold, when, when Nixon closed the gold window, gold would have been 35 or $42 an ounce. In 1971, you know, a brand new uh, Corvette uh, Stingray would have cost you 6,000 bucks. Now it's 105,000. So what happened? Did the Corvette become more expensive or is the dollar worth less? And when you talk about what's happened to the value of the dollar over an extended period of time, it continues to lose ground. We're told that the Fed strives for 2% inflation, but why not negative 2%? Because the lower the inflation rate, the higher the standard of living. And the 2% that they tell us about, Kai, is a bunch of nonsense. It's fooey. Interview John Williams of Shadow Stats once, and he'll tell you that the real number is 11 or 12%. So the bottom line is simply this, is that the purchasing power of gold and silver remain constant, whereas the dollar that we measure things against continues to be eroded slowly but surely from underneath us. And, you know, I'll give you an example. And, and this is from memory, okay? I used to talk about this all the time. In 1960, the price of gold was 39 bucks an ounce. 
And that was the average price of gold. And a house, according to the Census Bureau, was $17,000. Now, from memory, I will tell you that's 435 ounces of gold. So let's pretend that grandma and grandpa left 435 ounces of gold for your parents. And they said, look, you know, uh, what do we do? Do we buy a house right now uh, with the gold that grandma and grandpa gave us? Or do we stick it under our mattress where it will earn nothing but dust right now would be 64 years ago? And let's just say they pretended, or let's just pretend rather, that they decided to take out a mortgage and pay for it other ways and stuck the 435 ounces of gold under the mattress, which right now is about a million dollars plus. The average price of a house today, let's call it 400,000. Back then it was 17,000. So if you realize that now gold earning nothing but dust for the last 60 plus years would buy you two houses fully furnished, gold can actually accentuate in value. But the moral of the story is that it, it retains and preserves purchasing power as a house that would have been 17,000 is now over 400. So did the house become more expensive? Did gold become more expensive? Or did the dollar that we measure everything against become worth less? And I would say that gold in this case and the the house, uh, that's like uh, bars of, or, or let's call it sponges floating on the surface of the bathtub. And when you pull the plug, let me rephrase that. I apologize. What I meant to say is that gold is sitting on the ledge of the bathtub. When you pull the plug on the dollar, it's not that gold got higher. It's just that the dollar that we measured against fell further and further and further. And you're looking up at the value of gold. The house would have been a, a sponge floating on the surface. But the point of it is, is that it's not that the house got more expensive. It's not that gold got more expensive. It's that the dollar continues to be eroded out from underneath us. And in a government that in the last four years has printed more money than in the history of the United States prior to it, yeah, it's a big deal. It, it's a trend that's not showing any sign of abating. In fact, at a trillion dollars of debt every hundred days, a trillion seconds ago, Kai was 31,688 years ago. We are addicted to spending. The future of the dollar is in trouble, and that's why we own gold. No, it makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, at $40,000 gold, I'm curious how much a Big Mac would cost. Yeah, right. Well, that's the point. Right. That, that's exactly in the point. In U.S. dollar terms. So. Well, I mean, I remember in 1988 <laughs> or 1984 or five when I was in high school, our high school was across the street from the first McDonald's in Minnesota. And you could buy, you buy a hamburger for 49 cents. And now they're probably three bucks. So it's everything is increasing in dollar terms. Um, and, and yet gold is the barometer that measures that. And that's the constant. No. Andy, last time we chatted, we talked a lot about China and bullion banks, or like the, even the big banks, the big American banks or international banks, actually traveling to Shanghai and meeting with a bullion bank. There. Yes. And uh, we got a couple of questions on that. So like, and China needs silver for their industry too. So people are trying to wrap their head around like the concept you presented there is like, okay, why did they go to China to sort of cover up or to cover their their silver shorts? Because there's nowhere right. else to get it. The LBMA. So I think we need to break that down because we got a couple of questions like where people trying to understand, like, why would China sell silver short when they still need it? And to, like things like that. I think we might have to reiterate, like go through that conversation again and just clarify a couple of things. Like why would China even like entertain those conversations? Well, I'm sure there was quid pro quo. And the, the argument was that if you go to the Shanghai Metals Exchange website, you'll see starting the second week of March, four banks, Standard Charter, HSBC, JP Morgan, and Deutsche Bank all showed up one week after the other, after the other, after the other. And from that first moment, the inventories, the stockpiles in silver began to decrease. They're trading upwards ends of 2.9 billion ounces of silver per day, which is three and a half times yearly global mine supply on the LBMA. Who, who will admit to you it's the second lowest or the lowest amount of silver that they've had in the 140-year history of the exchange since they started keeping records. The, the COMEX is down to 60, 65 million ounces in the registered category, which are the bars backing or the contracts backing the bars for sale, which is by their own numbers, I don't know, almost 1,500% rehypothecated. The traditional pools of, of, of available silver have been drained in the West, and this is part of what they've been doing for a long time. So I think they went to the Shanghai Metals Exchange and said, listen, we need some help or we're going to blow up the whole system and it doesn't behoove any of us. The fact that they're selling silver to $4 premium to the Western price means they didn't make it easy on those banks. And did they get a better price? Probably. But I think, what did they have to give up for it? We don't know. There's supposition involved in this. But what is very intriguing is that you cannot export gold out of China. You can silver. 
if you realize that why else would these bullion banks show up at the Shanghai Metals Exchange if you can't take out gold, but you can silver, and then the stockpiles begin to fall, right at the same time they tell us that the Western supply is as low as it's ever been, putting two and two together using Occam's razor, one would think that's why they were there. So did the Chinese do it out of benevolence? Hell no. They did it because probably for their own reasons, their own self-serving reasons, uh, wouldn't do them any good to see the whole system blow up this early in the game if they're trying to accumulate as much as possible. And if you realize that Shanghai lists silver at about $4 higher than the LBMA or COMEX does, they are in the process at the same time of helping out the West of arbitraging anything that's not nailed down uh, in all of these vaults that are not immediately available for, for sale like in registered. There are a lot of investors out there who are holding silver in the eligible category or hidden in, in coffers at the LBMA where it's not for sale publicly that are entertaining this arbitrage. So yeah, I think it's one of these deals where China hasn't given up on silver even a little bit, but I think they did it to keep the game going a little bit longer. Yeah. Now, if you were to speculate though, what 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 is of interest to China right now that they would be you know, trading for? Gold. Gold. Um, I think you know gold to them is money. And if you look at the new Embridge system and the new unit, which was ju just came out, uh, Delma Rousseff, uh, former um, uh, well, she is now. She, I think she was the president of Brazil, if I'm not mistaken, but she is now the head of the BRICS New Development Bank, who came out publicly and said that it's been agreed upon in principle, the new BRICS settlement currency called the unit, which will be 40% gold-backed, which will be deliverable if requested uh, and be traded on Project Embridge. And so when you talk about the need for gold, it's extraordinary. And maybe that coincides with the fact that they publicly said we've stopped accumulating gold for a month or two at the same time they struck a deal with the big bullion banks. For me, it would be gold. But it's commodities, Kai. It's, it's, they realize that this is a Zoltan Pozar says, Bretton Woods 3, a system all about commodities. And I think whether you realize that they bought the London Metals Exchange a few years ago, which are the base metals, the copper, steel, zinc. They're striking deals all around the world in underdeveloped countries in South Africa, South, in Africa and South America for any any type of resources that they can help industrialize and help these countries uh, bring these natural resources to the uh, to the market uh, or even soft commodities buying grain and 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 corn and soybeans from from Brazil and uh, anything that they can get their hands on that are tangible let alone buying gold and silver at, at levels the world has never seen and being the largest producer of it too so I think they understand that this is all about commodities my guess would be it would be gold or some other very important commodity, but gold probably would be at the top of the list. New BRICS currency, like the, the name sounds ridiculous, the unit. I think they need a better marketing mm -hmm. team there, but uh, has that been decided? I haven't seen a lot of news about that. Yeah, like the 40% gold pack is the first time I'm hearing about it. Mm -hmm. So g can you give us some more color on that? So the unit would be a, so what's interesting is Project Embridge, which by the way, uh, does not support US dollars. Um, where Saudi Arabia just became a full participant in the Project Embridge, which is a big deal. It's, it's a, a with a bank of international <laughs> settlements, correct? Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. And who reclassified gold as the only other tier one asset? Oh, yeah, that's right. It's the <laughs> BIS. And when you talk about this being a BIS project, originally the four charter members would have been China, Hong Kong, Thailand, and the United Arab Emirates, and 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 now the BIS behind it, who reclassified gold tier one. Uh, they said, in principle, Delma Rousseff did come out and say in the last meeting that they had in, in St. Petersburg that, yes, indeed, uh, we have, in principle, agreed to a new settlement currency called the unit, which will be 40 percent gold and 60 percent a basket of the BRICS currencies. And what's interesting about it, too, Kai, is, is that they talk about the unit being... Um, a tool that will will be immune from sanctions, as will Project Embridge. But the interesting thing about it is that if you read the white paper on the unit, it talks about um, the fact that the gold that will be backing will be held within the borders of all of these countries. They don't have to send it anywhere, um, a central common location. They will need to be audited, and, and there are stiff penalties for not adhering to the guidelines of, of the protocol of the unit, but when you realize all of these countries are not only buying gold massively, but repatriating it. Look what Saudi Arabia and Egypt just did in a handful of African countries, brought all their gold back from India. 
and India bought one and a half times the amount of gold they did all of last year and brought it all home plus 100 metric tons that they've been holding since 1991 at the Bank of England. You see, all of these countries would leave their gold at the Bank of England to access safely the LBMA, have it held safely in a country with rule of law and the whole nine yards. And COMEX would be the would be the New York Fed. And so all of these countries like like Saudi Arabia, like Egypt, like all of the African countries on top of the German Bundesbank, on top of uh, Hungary and Turkey and Poland and Austria and the Czech National Bank, the Dutch, they all brought their gold back from the New York Fed and the Bank of England. So what this project Embridge allows, and remember, Saudi Arabia is now a full participant in it, it allows for the cross-border payment system where each one of these countries will be able to remain... Uh, retain their monetary autonomy, their monetary authority. There's not a common currency, but a common settlement currency. So everyone keeps their own currency, can trade over Project Embridge, which sidesteps the SWIFT, but settle in the unit settlement currency, which is 40% gold backed and is redeemable if they want. And so it, it really what it does, it lights the fuse on the dollar bomb. And at the same time, it, it really curtails the need or the incentive to own U.S. treasuries, which can be weaponized. And this is why I think we're seeing all these countries buy gold, Kai, because not only has gold since 2000 outperformed the 10-year the treasury by, by double, it has no counterparty liability, it cannot be taken or confiscated the way that the treasury market has been proven to be weaponized. You, you mentioned transparency is important and people have to, or c countries will have to report how does that fit with China? Like they're, they're so intransparent about their gold ownership. Like how does that fit into their- Well, and I'm uh, glad you asked that question because there's been a lot of talk lately about the gold revaluation account. Uh, the, the head of the Dutch National Bank talks about it all the time. He says, yeah, our, our balance sheet's turning negative, but we're okay because we know we have $20 billion in the gold revaluation account. And for people who don't understand, gold would traditionally be on the side of the balance sheet as an asset. But in central bank rule, you're not allowed to offset your gold with a liability. So on the other side, on the liability side, there's the mirror image called the gold revaluation account, where it's valued at 35 bucks an ounce, by the way. And basically what he's insinuating is that we can revalue gold to a, to a much higher level. And just like that, our balance sheet goes from putrid to pristine and, and change the rules so that you can offset it. Well, if you realize that a, the BIS reclassified gold tier one. B, all of these countries, the central banks, are buying it at a level the world has never seen. C, they're all repatriating their gold. D, the BIS is part of Project Ambridge, and the unit white paper says the gold will be held in the country's own sovereignty. It will be audited. So if you are going to revalue gold at some point because it's going to be pegged to a monetary system, a new monetary system, you would be a whole hell of a lot smarter to not tell the world how much you buy and then say, oh, we're revaluing gold. Here's our stockpile of 40,000 metric tons that Alistair McLeod will say 20,000 owned by the state and 20,000 owned by the people. So to be transparent is is foolish. Why why has the U.S. not audited their gold holdings at Fort Knox for the last 60 years? Why? And the point of it is, is, is you know, since 1956, even going even back further than that, 70 years. Why? These countries do not have a vested interest in being transparent. The U.S. is at the top of the food chain on that. So I would say to you, just by the four to 500 metric tons a year that China produces, and has been for 25 years. We're supposed to believe they only have 26 metric tons. I have a bridge to sell you. It wouldn't do any good for them to be open until and if we see gold revalued to be part of a new system. And when you see the BIS behind all of this stuff and Saudi Arabia and all of these countries buying and repatriating their gold, put it all together. It sure makes a lot of sense to me. I do have to ask you about the Embridge system yeah. what, and what that actually is. Because I think it's based on Ethereum and uh, the blockchain technology there. But I'm like, I'm a complete novice in that regard. So well, can, so can you explain I. it a little I bit? Mean, like, I, do you what it is, it's a cross-border payment system that allows countries to trade central bank digital currencies with one another outside of the SWIFT system. Hmm. And they they did a few tra test trades last year. Both of them, I find it interesting because I've been saying for over a year that gold and oil have been remonetized. That gold and oil are becoming more important than the currencies that they use to buy them. In fact, maybe even more important than than treasuries is the realization. The first two trades that were done, I believe, were between China and the United Arab Emirates. Digital yuan, cross-border payment using using the Ambridge, which sidesteps SWIFT, 
for gold and for oil. And so it is just the ability for all of these countries to use their own new central bank digital currency to trade with one another without the interference of the U.S. intermediary banks or the SWIFT system. You mentioned the U.S. dollar bomb has been lit, uh, or the fuse has been lit on the U.S. dollar bomb. Yeah. I think we need to talk about that implications and ramifications of uh, that new unit currency potentially coming online. Timeline is a different story, but like, w what could be the effect? Like, any sane in investor, or anybody who's got cash, why wouldn't they trade U.S. dollar, whatever it is, for that new currency? Like, it should be a massive run from USD. I don't unit. think it's available for all of us peasants. I think it's more <laughs> of a central bank thing okay. or large corporations or, or commercial banks. If you look at some of the names on Enbridge, you have uh, Goldman Sachs, you have um, HSBC Bank, you have many sovereign governments, many of them as observers right now. Um, but when you look at the U.S., you are far more of a person who tells the truth and gives news than the mainstream media in the United States does. The mainstream media in the United States doesn't do a bad job of telling us what's happening. They do no job. They create divisiveness, but they don't tell us what's happening around the globe. People can't get out of the way, Kai, what they never see coming. And so people listening to me and you may have a fighting chance to get out of the way of what they don't see coming. Do a little digging. Look at Project Enbridge. Um, you go right to the website and read it. Look at the, the unit white paper. It'll blow your mind. And these things are happening. The de-dollarization is happening. And it's a little by little by little by little. And then bang, all at once, as we've talked about yeah. before. Logarithmic decay is what I'm talking about. So the fuse has been lit. How long is it is? And before that all at once moment, don't know, brother. But <laughs> I think it's coming. So, Andy, we're at the Rules Symposium. And uh, you're, you're presenting twice. I think one of your titles is Too Foolish to Not to Be Planned. Yeah. Uh, let, let's start with this presentation. Like, w What's the main takeaway? What do you want the investors to learn from that presentation? I want them to have an open mind and realize that the things that we have done globally and domestically, to me, seem too stupid to be stupid. Um, you know, let's start at home first. <laughs> It started with a, a, a merit-based system that's worked forever in this country being usurped for lifestyle and uh, gender preference uh, traits. Uh, we can talk about the lawlessness in the big cities. We can talk about 18 million people or more being led into this country illegally. Immigration status up in the air, that's for sure. And then we can talk about the elections and the judicial system, which I think whether it doesn't matter, this isn't a political statement, whatever side of the aisle you're on, people around the world, and it's not lost on them, say, what the hell's happened to the U.S.? They're, you know, it, 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 are their elections fair or not? Is the judicial system fair or is it two-tiered or not? And I think these things, I think people look at this country in a very different way. Um, people used to come to this country and assimilate and, and contribute. Now we're letting millions and millions and millions of people here unvetted um, who are destabilizing the inner cities. I would, I, would, uh, I would really implore your listeners to Google and read a very short um, reading on the Cloward Piven theory. Uh, which is something you'll read it and you'll be like, my goodness gracious, it's what they're doing. It. Cloward and Piven were husband and wife professors at, at uh, Columbia University in the 60s, who, by the way, Obama and Jared Bernstein went there. Jared Bernstein's the lead economic advisor to the U.S., who advocates for loss of the reserve status, by the way. He's the knucklehead who many of your listeners would have seen on X on Twitter trying to uh, explain bond purchases and money creation. It was humiliating. Watch it if you haven't. Go to Twitter and look up Jared Bernstein. I've seen that yes, one. <laughs> it's unbelievable. In fact, it'll be part of my presentation. But anyways, uh, you look at what's happened here, and this country is not what it once was, and the people are looking at it very goofy, let alone creating a trillion dollars in debt every hundred days. A trillion seconds ago being 31,688 years ago. It took 200 years to do the first trillion. Now we're doing it in just over three months. And when you realize all of this stuff is bad enough at home, look what we've done around the world. I mentioned Jared Bernstein. His thesis is to lose the reserve status. We weaponized the dollar. We've, we've by, by confiscating Russian assets, to not only confiscate them, but to give them to the Ukraine in the form of, of weapons, which is a line you can never come back from, in my opinion, once you cross it. But, you know, you got Janet Yellen saying to uh, CNN a few weeks ago, well, you know, we're okay with... Um, with uh, China, Xi Jinping, and Putin being friends. And my immediate thought was, well, geez, thank, thank you, Madam Secretary. That's so benevolent of you. But if, if Xi gives one penny to Putin for his war efforts, we will sanction their banks, their companies in Beijing itself, never mind 
that we've given 260 billion to the Ukraine and Stinger missiles and F-16s and the intelligence were to drop it because we don't count. That type of hip uh, hypocrisy, let alone an executive order signed to go green, which is certainly not what you want to tell Saudi Arabia. And look what they've done. <laughs> they've joined the BRICS. They've joined the SCO. They've joined the Belt Road with all the other um, OPEC countries. They, they've joined the New Development Bank. They are now a full participant in Enbridge. You can see the progression they have made. So we've signed an executive order to go green. We've weaponized the dollar. We've destabilized the country. This is something that I think little by little by little all at once certainly plays comes into play. But you have to ask yourself, did they not think that these things would have ramifications or is it too stupid to not be planned? And I, why would they do it? Well, this is how you reset the system. Because the number two in charge at the, at the U.S. government is Lael Brainerd, a modern monetary theorist. She's the number two economic advisor. She issued the uh, or worked on and developed the CBDC when at the Boston Fed a few years ago with MIT and that the U.S. government was they fast tracked the development of it. Biden did. And she worked with MIT in its development. She also ran point on Fed now, which came out seven, eight months ago, which is being beta tested right now by a handful of banks. It's Venmo and Zelle on steroids <laughs> backed by the Fed. She wants this to happen. So. The, my, my, I guess my main point is simply this, that the actions that we have taken both domestically and abroad have ramifications. And are we too naive to believe that these actions wouldn't have blowback? Or is this exactly what they're trying to do? Because if you look at the 2023 balance sheet of the U.S. government, you'll see a $5 trillion asset base and 150 or $60 trillion in debt. Um, that's on top of the $34 trillion debt, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, government, yeah. military pensions, et cetera. How do you reset the system? You find a villain. And the, and when they all dump dollars like that, that little by little leads to an all at once, then it becomes real because the byproduct of interest rates that spike to the moon and everything resets and it's their fault, not ours. Could it be? Don't know. I'll leave that up to your listeners. Oh, really interesting. How, how long do you have to present that? <laughs> not long enough. <laughs> not long enough. So it's challenging to yeah. do it that way. So my, uh, my 45 minute presentation is much more in depth the 15 minute presentation, just enough to show them all the stupidity that we've done and make people think, geez, you know, you look at these things, not very prudent to do these things. Uh, JP Morgan came up with a silver price target of $34. I don't know, when I read that, I thought that that headline is like oxymoron. Like it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit together. Um, j just the headline itself. Like JP Morgan is in the bullion business. We all know that. But what do you make of that? Like, well, not only are they in the bull bullion business, you know, they paid a $920 million fine a few years ago, the largest fine ever by the Justice Department to, to for manipulating the metals market. They are also the custodian of the world's largest silver trust. And, um, you know, Ted Butler, God, um, God rest his soul, talked about JP Morgan being really the the orchestrator, if you will, of all of this suppression on COMEX. And I would also urge everyone to listen to Chris Marcus's interview with Bart Chilton. Bart Chilton died as well. He was the head of the CFTC. This was several years ago when he gave this interview to Chris Marcus, Arcadia Economics, where he admitted this stuff. He said J.P. Morgan indeed inherited Bear Stearns' short position, was called into uh, Jamie Dimon, was called into um, Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke's office for uh, to for this. He said, you know, Jamie, we need, or they said, Jamie, we need you to take this short position. And Jamie said, well, we will, but we will be in, in violation of position limits if we do that. And he was told, well, you have a certain amount of time to uh, get that in order. And at the end of that time frame, Bart Chilton, who was the head of the CFTC, the commodity police, went back into his superior's office and said, um, not only have they not pared down their position as they agreed to, in fact, they've increased it. They're in violation of our agreement and antitrust law. They need to be prosecuted. He was told to back down. It was a political decision. He admitted all of this on Chris's show. He died a week later. Now, he supposedly died of cancer. I'm not saying there is a correlation here, but what I am saying is it was the only time he ever gave, the, gave this, this presentation or this interview and, and admitted all of this stuff. So when J.P. Morgan, who has been the architect of suppressing the prices forever, says that, you have to wonder. Maybe they are acquiescing to the reality that silver is going much higher. And uh, right now, if you look at what is the price of silver in China? Well, it's pretty damn close to 35 bucks an ounce on Shanghai. So it's not so outlandish whatsoever. Yeah, yeah interesting. L last question, Andy. I'm interviewing the chairman of the Silver Institute later this week. Mm. What should I ask him? You know, 
he's not a bad guy. Oh, personally, I have no problem yeah, with him. I, but I, but I, Phillips the, is a nice guy. The yeah. questions that I would ask him, he would re, refute. And, and I would just simply say to him and show him a chart of the way that the AM fix and the PM fix has, has driven the, 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 the price of silver down over and over and over and over again for years and years and years. We're heading into New York. The price falls off a cliff. This is not how markets work. And I guess just the realization that the, the price of silver and gold have been managed by Western central banks, which is, is you know, I don't think you can refute it anymore. And I bang my head against the wall when, when, when groups try and refute this. And um, I would just, you know, it's a tough one because he wants to always debate people like myself. Um, Jeffrey's a good guy, but Jeffrey, I think, and I look at the world completely and totally different. And I would just look at what Chris Powell says. There are no free markets anymore, just manipulations to, to expect that silver and gold markets behave this way. And that's just natural is not right. And it's uh, if there's a chart made by a man named Dimitri Speck, who takes 10 years worth of time and condenses it into one chart. And the AM fix and the PM fix in London, the price falls straight down if you look at all this in a condensed time frame. Um, and it's not right. It's not how markets work. And they have been managed to support the illusion of, of dollar supremacy and bond market strength. Maybe just to open his mind a little bit into, into accepting that reality would be a step in the right direction. But I, I don't think you'll have much luck. So <laughs> we'll see what he has to say. I'll be interested to listen to, to your interview. Perfect. No, I appreciate it. Andy, wonderful conversation as always. always I really appreciate you, know, I appreciate you joining us here in our little podcast studio. It's like first time we're bringing out the big mics and the big guns here. But uh, I think the audio should be fine. So appreciate it. You're Thank one you. of the best, buddy. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to doing it again with you sometime soon. Likewise. Likewise, Andy. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bye. everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially from the Rule Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. If you haven't done so, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. We really appreciate it. What do you think about the conversation? Did we ask the right questions of Andy? Where do you think, where do you think things are headed? What do you think of the Enbridge system as well? Really want to hear from you. It makes a big difference to us because we can, we can use your comments and ask those questions in your conversations. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots, lots more here from Florida.